Um, I thought I'd go with the pink today, but uh, thinking I'd be the only one and you know stand out and stuff. But Denver's actually gone with it too, so um, no, that didn't work. But um, I'm, I'm listening to these speakers, and they all have this this wealth of knowledge and experience that they can really draw upon um, to sort of provide their recommendations, right? And so I'm sort of standing here as an 8, 10-year-old boy um, going, wow, like, I can't, I don't have this wealth of knowledge just yet, but what I do is I swim up and down the pool a lot. So <laughs> we'll take that and we'll, we'll provide uh, what I think should happen uh, based off that, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, if you could, oh, is there, are there slides here? Oh, beautiful. Okay, so um, I'll just start at the start obviously. Um, so, I was born in England um, and I also have a twin brother. Um, and so this was really helpful for me and my family to sort of shoehorn me into um, normal sporting activities, right? Because everything that Adam does, who's my twin, I also do, right? So cricket and anything else, right? I just go in there, there's no questions asked. Um, yeah, no questions asked. And then so, from there, we sort of build the um, thing, what is it? The expectation that um, nothing is different about me, which is good, right? Because then you sort of, you say, wow, like I can do everything that these kids can do and there's nothing different or um, nothing special about me in the way that people have to sort of stand back and go, whoa, like this, this guy is sort of disabled and different. Let's sort of bring all the pressure off him and let him do his own thing. So I learned and developed with Adam. And so this really helped me because obviously I was treated the same and so I learned the same lessons that everyone does in sport, which is obviously resilience and character building and that sort of thing. So from there, that was really helpful because then I, I learned the love for sport and those sort of things. And I think if you sort of saw me as a disabled kid and sort of pulled back and said, whoa, like, let's not, let's not pr pressure him and uh, let him achieve his goals and treat him like a normal kid, I wouldn't have got the, um, the benefits of sport, if that makes sense. So just my swimming journey. Um, I started in a club called Superfins. Now, the um, chairperson's here tonight, but no, nothing um, sort of changes, but they, they're very, yeah, don't worry, it's, it was positive anyway, the review was positive, I'm not, I'm not gonna, <laughs> but um, they are very inclusion based, right? And so I started swimming there, and this is all about getting people in and really starting to love the sport, emphasis on inclusion and friendship and that sort of thing. So from a young age, I was taught, right, this is, this is fine, this is, um, this is a good thing for you to be doing, right? And so these are the benefits. I made heaps of friends, loved the sport, and I think that's where my passion started. I think this is really important, right? You need to get the young kids in at a foundational level, uh, whether they're able-bodied, disabled, female, male, um, and just say, right, this is why you play this sport, right? This is the passions here, and it's not, it's not money-based, it's not anything-based. It's all about the passion, so you've got to love it. And so from the foundational levels for the clubs, in this room, just yeah, just get the, the love of the sport there and I think um, dropout rates and everything else will sort of reduce because you've got this nice foundation of people who really want to play the sport because they love the sport. Um, and then I sort of went on this ping pong journey where I was going from coach to coach and we sort of went through this phase where every, every coach I'd go through, um, I'd have two years with them and then they'd go off and I'd go to Karatha or go to the um, to England, and so I thought that um, I had really bad luck, right? Because um, coaching is quite like an intimate thing, and so you get used to this uh, coach and their little um, little mannerisms and what they like doing and all that sort of stuff, and then they go right, and then you say you have to adjust to a new club, a new environment. But what I learned from this is that I've, I've actually been really privileged. Um, because I've got to experience these different people and different coaching styles, so I think that's really helped me because it's sort of made me a more well-rounded athlete, if that makes sense. So the coach I'm with now, he's, you know, um, he's pretty tough, um, so he doesn't give me much, much flack, but I think I'm fine with that because that's where I'm at with my swimming career, and I think you need to, uh, with all athletes, tailor your 
approach to the age of the athlete, the interests of the athlete, and try and make it as individualised as possible. Um, so, just, yeah. So, uh, inclusion solutions sort of have um, the, this framework, and I think I kind of want to base my stuff off of it because I think it's really, really good and really, really helpful. Um, a lot of people um, sort of come up to me and go, well, we know that we should be including people, but how do we include people? What are some good examples? Um, what did work for you? What didn't work? And so I'm going to try and sort of give some um, helpful recommendations on what did work for me and what didn't. So um, the first one that I've highlighted, um, I'm sure if you ask Amy or Denver, they can give you the foundations for inclusion. But the first one I've um, highlighted is attitude. So from a coaching perspective, um, are you open to accepting these people? Like, are you open to the possibility of having to change your program or change the way you approach things or learn new things um, on the fly, basically? So are you capable of taking on this challenge? Because it is a challenge, right? But um, one that hopefully is worth it. But in the end, yeah, the base question is, are you willing to do these things? Um, so that's the first one. And then um, also, the attitude also comes down to um, your, if, you're, if you're the coach at a club, the way you uh, treat these different athletes, I'll say, um, is, and the, the way you respond to them and include them is how the other people in the club are going to, they're going to follow suit, right? So your coach uh, at a, let's, oh, I'll just keep it in swimming. But if the coach talks to me in an in a, uh, inclusive way and he doesn't treat me like uh, something, uh, something different and something to be scared of, then the other swimmers in the club are going to follow suit. So I think at a, as a big role um, in your organisation, it's really important to set this standard for all athletes. Um, just so everyone follows suit, no question asked. If you're a good role model, then, um, then it sort of just happens. The second thing is um, communication. So I think um, I'm going to take this as sort of a coach between a swimmer, but you can sort of adapt it to your own context. But for me, um, communication is incredibly important for um, any sort of relationship in, in sport in particular. Um, so I, I sort of always have to say, this is working, this isn't working. And then my coach will go, I want this. How do we achieve this? I w yeah, I want your kick to be better, but obviously um, having cerebral palsy, my legs aren't, aren't up to scratch. But um, he sort of says, look, how can we achieve this by doing these certain things in the stroke, right? So we're always communicating. We're always saying what can work, what doesn't work. And I think this is really essential. Um, as you go through the weeks and the months of the season, your goals adapt and change. So you always need to keep your communication lines open to your athlete's needs and um, how, how you progress right in the sport. Um, the second um, piece of thing uh, that the inclusion solutions provide is this um, inclusion pyramid. Um, I think this is really important, but I will focus on just the functional and social inclusion. So the interesting thing that I experienced in my short career is that um, there's two ways that um, coaches usually include me uh, into their programs. So the first thing is, um, is that they put me in with swimmers of the same uh, ability, like same speed, right? So that will always sort of put me in with 12-year-old, 11-year-olds, girls and boys, which obviously isn't ideal because there's an age gap, there's an experience gap, and there's also a goals mismatch, right? So I want to um, compete for the, for, the, uh, for the country and everyone else is sort of just, you know, still in it for fun, maybe wants to go to state, but there's this mismatch, right? And so this I, I perceive as not social inclusion, right? It's more functional inclusion, which is good, right? Because I'm still in the program, but it's just not what I really want because obviously, yeah, there's just the, the mismatch. Um, and then obviously... The second half, which is the functional inclusion, is what I just talked about. But then the, the second um, ethos of the, the coach is, well, he's 18. He's um, obviously at a quite a high level. How do I adjust for that, right? And so they'll put me in their top program with 
21, 22 year old uh, males and females. And I think this works better, right? Because this like like mind like mindedness works really well because then I can um, sort of mix with them, but it's not as jarring as you would first think. Because for me, sport is a great leveler, right? Everyone respects achievement in sport, and so people are able to look past uh, age or disability and recognise your sporting achievements for what it is. And so when I was 14, I was in a squad where the average age was 19. And so obviously at first they were like, wow, well, this kid's like 14, doesn't know what he's doing, like inexperienced, blah, blah, blah. But um, they sort of found that um, my goals were the same, my achievements were the same. And so uh, pretty quickly, actually, everyone just sort of accepted me, right? And so I think, um, regardless of sport, um, this will always happen, whether it's like all inclusions, right? So like female, gender, anyway, um, this will always happen. So if you put your uh, pe new members with people of like, with like-minded goals, and you, you, their achievements are the same, it'll always work better than if you put it with um, their functional capabilities because the goals are so similar and the achievements are so similar that people will just gel anyway over this shared like connection because obviously sport is pretty tough and you gel over your experiences and um, trials and triumphs. Um, and so I think that's just my sort of main point is uh, social inclusion is is the way to go forward for me, at least for the um, at the elite end of the spectrum. If uh, social inclusion is is what what needs to happen effectively for um, inclusion to happen at its at its highest sort of level. Um, I've got to, oh, it might be a bit loud, um, <laughs> but. Um, this is just me um, at the Pampax last year, which were in Cairns for July. And so uh, just a couple of things. The uh, production value of this video was just as good as the production value of the AbleBods, which was really good to see. And it really um, sort of lifted the profile of us. So the, the treatment and the, we had a dedicated media team and it's all happening, right? So the power, power movement is going really well. And I think this, uh, also added to the swimming population accepting us more as athletes because of these high quality productions and the way they were treating us was the same as the AbleBot, so there's less of a difference. The second thing is, um, obviously I'm really, like you can see in my smile that I'm really enjoying it. And I think um, that's always, yeah, always the base, right? So like I said, once you have a foundation of uh, enjoying the sport, then obviously it takes you places, but you might be able to see with my little cheeky grin that I'm, yeah, quite enjoying the experience. Uh, experience but um, maybe it might be not as loud. Well. I'm stoked. I knew I had to get out fast if I wanted to post a good time. And I had confidence in my back end, so just really had to motor home. And you know what? Did just that. Yeah, I was a bit nervous before the race. I just put a bit of pressure on myself trying to get the best out of myself but um, you know once you hear the crowd get it give you a bit of a roar then it's all sweet I knew knew I had the crowd behind me so why not just give it a go that's in the books that is definitely in the books get it framed just do whatever I can mate that was a like, great moment great moment now uh, we just got to go 58 hey and it will be Australia that takes it Ben Hoppen 59-3-3 I'm trying to get down to my PB and... That's Ellie Cole as well, who's probably the most uh, prominent para swimmer. But um, yeah, so I was always enjoying it and, um, and obviously going under, under the minute for the first time is um, pretty incredible. But I uh, just wanted to sum up real quick um, and I hope that you're able to take something uh, useful away from this. And with the risk of sounding a little arrogant, uh, I am sort of the example of what happens if everything goes right, right? So if you have a good foundation and uh, you're part of these communities and clubs that include you, that don't count you as someone that's different, you can benefit from this, this wealth of 
uh, acceptance, if you will, and you can really perform at the highest level. And I don't think it's that hard to do because, like I said, I was ping-ponging everywhere. Like it wasn't quite, it wasn't a straightforward journey. It wasn't streamlined by any by any means. But I think um, hopefully, uh, as we move forward into into the future, there's there's more of me's. If that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs>